If I was a character in the One Piece series, I would have no Devil Fruit power and I would be one of the mightiest hockey users out there. What's up guys, it's your boy King back at it again with more One Piece content and today I want to talk about something very crucial. So our boy Hiro Oda is on the spot today. Let's get into it. I have a bone to pick with Oda because I am not happy with what he's done with my boys. I literally spent hours on end talking about how King rivals an admiral and then he does something like this. On a completely related topic, it's quite irritating to be in Zambia because for some reason when a new manga chapter drops, I'm the last one to see it because chapter 1053 just dropped a couple of hours ago while I was sleeping. But I diverge. What I really want to address are four important topics that make the series feel like it was written by Togashi. I know I might catch some else for this, but am I seriously the only person who saw this? The first matter involves the new bounties that have been announced and I promised myself that no matter how long it took, I would review the whole chapter, giving all my opinions and that I would carry out a thorough analysis until I gain a bit more of an understanding of uh, Oda's choices. The second matter at hand is that of Tengu and of course this one is actually refreshing because for the fans who are interested in the story and mystery of the series, this grand review pushes the story a bit further. Thirdly and honestly this is the most important one because it gives an insight as to how fast Oda wants to end this entire series. I'm fast as fuck boy! Yep, that's right. The defeat of king and queen at the hands of Admiral Greenbow because his actual name is hard to pronounce and I won't even waste my time attempting to do so. That's just lazy writing. And at number 4 we have everyone's favorite topic which is the announcement of the new Yonkos and if we are being honest it's mainly because of Oda's bold choice to add buggy in the mix. <clears throat> it's not fire. Oh brother this guy stinks! Big News Morgans is the president of the World Economy newspaper and one of the Underworld's emperors. Uh, now this man has a unique talent. I believe if he wanted he could convince people that he is among the Yonkos of the ocean. So for whatever reason Morgans decided not to tell the story that the world government wanted him to tell and like I covered in a previous video, the world government will stop at nothing to prevent the truth of the void century from being revealed. Morgans has a deep respect for Luffy and his accomplishments because on some occasions he has been known to have exaggerated his stories of the pirate. This might be a major reason as to why he took a big guess on the world government and risked his own life. Now if the world government had the heart to destroy an entire island of people because a few of them knew the forbidden history of the world, I'm pretty sure Morgans understands the type of situation he's placed himself in. Of course, it's no secret that this man carries a bias towards some of the stories he's presented. If something catches his fancy, he presents it in a good light. And it's a bit touching because for what seems to be the first time, he's presenting a story in its actual narrative. Which kind of shows us that at the end of it all, he is first and foremost a journalist. The gears of the world won't stop turning. I won't let their propaganda slide when the real story is this thrilling. If you're like me, you're probably asking where was this honesty during the whole cake arc? And the answer is pretty simple, it's just good writing. If Morgans had not presented his story in the narrative it took, Big Mom would have not had the incentive to go after Luffy and therefore she would not have been part of this arc. But I diverge yet again my people. Now Morgans does not appear to have a good relationship with the government. He refused to accept a bribe from them in exchange for not revealing a specific event at the level. When he was threatened by a Cypherpo agent, he quickly beat up the agent and told his employees to relocate their headquarters to avoid government retaliation. So this man's a badass and an asshole. So in a way, we can say he's a revolutionary, but honestly speaking, I find it hard to actually entertain this idea. Because this man despite this generous act is very selfish, but I think people can change, right? He, he, he can change. Now I just love to see the world government lose their cool over things like this. A secret that they've spent 800 years concealing is finally being revealed and they appear completely powerless to stop it. The control they once had appears to be gradually falling apart as we see a soldier giving a report of what has happened to the Gorsei. Now this man does not look happy at all as he remarks that they did not authorize the use of Luffy's gear fifth form on his wanted poster and that the D in his name should not have been placed there. Looking at the history of One Piece, how many people actually know of the Wheel of D and Joy Boy? 
I think at first glance it appears to be quite peculiar that the government is this agitated unless they understand that the revolutionary army or the few people who actually know of the government secrets can actually use this against them. Now currently we have 5 key players in this game, Blackbeard, Shanks, Luffy, Dragon and Robin and unless I'm forgetting another key player please remind me and this is important information for later use so just keep it in mind. Now the world government has done something that is quite genius in my opinion. Now a lot of people are wondering why in the hell did they give Luffy the same bounty as Law and Kid. After all, he beat the strongest creature in the world. Well my friends, because they know better than to give Luffy more attention than they need him to have. For the very fact that Luffy has been revealed to be Joy Boy to us and the land of Wano, if we're being honest, the jump from a 1.5 billion belly bounty to a whopping 3 billion is just as good. Now they have seen the devastating effects of Joy Boy as Mihawk once said, that is no skill or technique but the simple ability to turn those around him into his allies. Now the girls they know a lot about the Void Century and Joy Boy. How they came to this knowledge is anyone's guess. They might be immortal or they might have learned about it from Mimosama. Like previously stated, very few people know the actual truth of the Void Century. But from what they know, Joy Boy was a man who had a tremendous effect among the people in his time. And Luffy has the same effect in that after visiting any place he goes, he inspires a mindset of freedom. We saw this at Dressrosa, Arabasta, Arlong Park, Skypea, and Fishman Island. The mentality he has always carried every time this has happened has always been, he's simply doing it for one individual or for his own selfish desire. And we saw it again at Wano. If the world government decided to give Luffy a higher bounty than Law and Kid, it would have definitely raised a few eyebrows. Because unlike Luffy, they care about what people think. And one of the ways the world government has managed to keep the world on a leash is that they have always managed to control the narrative. Just like Doflamingo put it, pirates are evil, the marines are righteous. These terms have always changed throughout the course of history. Kids who have never seen peace and kids who have never seen war have different values. Those who stand at the top determine what's wrong and what's right. This very place is neutral ground. Justice will prevail, you say. But of course it will. Whoever wins this war becomes justice. 800 years ago, the world government won the war against Joy Boy and the ancient kingdom of the D clan. But on this day, Luffy has set the stage for more neutral ground and has once more declared war against the world government. In all honesty, they have managed to maintain their power at the expense of the people's loyalty to them. The type of patriotism that comes from a person who is proud to be part of a nation is non-existent to the majority of the world's inhabitants. The separation they created between races and the bias justice they have towards a certain class of people have all been key elements that have led to this very moment. From what I've just said, it's clear how fragile their system has always been. Luffy doesn't need fancy words to rally people behind him, because the world's inhabitants will take their chances with a lawless pirate who can challenge the corrupt system that they've been forced to live under for centuries. Of course, there are two sides to the One Piece world. No boys and common folk, but if you ask me, the common folk make up the majority of, uh, of their world. However, in the eyes of the world government only nobles are people and this type of reasoning will eventually turn the people against them and it seems like it already has. And in my opinion, Luffy is just a catalyst. Now during the incident on Konomi Island, the marines had the opportunity to save the people but they did nothing. At Dressrosa, they could have stopped Doflamingo but did nothing again and Arabasta is the same. However, at Sabodia Capelago, they were quick to move because the life of a world noble was threatened. And uh, between me and you guys, I was quite happy that Luffy gave that bastard his, you know, moving on. I, I don't want to get cancelled, moving on. With all that said, I say good job order, now for the second matter. Alright guys, this is it. Get ready, because you know just how much of a nerd I am for a good plot twist. So Tengu is actually Kozuki Sukiyaki. Now I might actually not be pronouncing the name right but I just had to say it. Everything has started to fall into place at this point and all of the plot elements are starting to align. With a few exceptions of course, the story we know of this man is as follows. Sukiyaki's father was airless many years ago and the daimyos were concerned about who would succeed him. The Kurozumi family's leader took advantage of this by poisoning the other daimyos in order to become the sole candidate left. Fortunately, the Kozuki line produced an heir and Sukiyaki would eventually succeed his father as shogun of Wano country. He fathered a son named Kozuki Oden 59 years ago who irritated him due to his erratic behavior. 
Tsukiyaki Lee Sender's Banzaburo listed all the amazing but also disgraceful things his son Oden had done so far. 41 years ago, right after his son Oden failed in his 38th attempt to leave the country, shit, 38? Wait, 38 attempts? Yes. He then directed his aide to deliver a message to Oden in which he stated that he was disowning him. Now, Sukiyaki then exiled Oden from the flower capital, citing the various violent crimes Oden had committed. A few years later, Kurozumi Higurashi came to the palace disguised as Oden with a Mane Mane no Mi between 33 and 30 years ago and recommended that Kurozumi Oruchi be given a job in the castle. And of course, Sukiyaki obliged, unaware of the deception, of course. Sukiyaki became ill 30 years ago and Oden paid him a visit. Sukiyaki mentioned how Oden had matured into a fine man during their conversation. And remember, they had never spoken to each other before. Sukiyaki was said to have died after Oden's second year with the Whitebeard Pirates. Later on, Sukiyaki was impersonated by Higurashi around the time of his alleged death, and Oruchi was appointed as his successor. Oden wondered if Sukiyaki's death was caused by their actions at the time rather than natural illness, and Oruchi did not respond, being the slime boy and piece of shit that he is. So, up until this point, the only information Oda had given us was that Sukiyaki had died, but now he reveals this. Apparently, Sukiyaki did not die and was allegedly imprisoned by Higurashi. But he does not see it that way. To him, he failed his people and decided that he would never show his face to them again. Now, if you ask me, he did more harm than good by not showing his face. If I were a citizen of Wano, I wouldn't care if it was Oden or Sukiyaki who showed up. The main point would be that it's a familiar face. After all, the people were eager to see the return of the Kozuki family. According to my understanding, Oda got the idea of Wano from the Edo period of Japan, and the protectors of Wano are based on the real samurai of the country. Back in the day, these guys had a code they lived by, known as Bushido. They believed it was better for them to die rather than live with the shame of their failure. This is an idea that Oda also adopted, as we saw with Kinemon during the fire in Kozuki Castle. It was revealed that he was able to escape and make it to the surface, but by the time he did, it was too late. The country had been destroyed and his son had died, making this one of the saddest stories yet. He even went as far as to actually admit that he contemplated committing seppuku, which is ritual suicide. But all that sad stuff aside, because yes, it happened. And rather than being angry, I believe Momo will be relieved that, to learn that his grandfather is, is still alive, because Momo desperately needs a father figure in his life. I know, Kinemon has been there, but he needs someone who reminds him of his father and knows how to run the country. But aside from that, Robin has introduced a new topic involving the weapon Pluton. Although this isn't actually a new topic, it was the central focus of Frankie's bounty and it played a significant role in the Water 7 arc. But what does Pluton have to do with Wano and what is this weapon? Well, let's go to the One Piece wiki and revisit our archived memories. So, Pluton along with Poseidon and Uranus is one of the three ancient weapons. Pluton is the world's worst battleship, a highly advanced warship capable of mass destruction. It was built a long time ago in the Grand Line city of Water 7. The battleship is said to be sleeping somewhere in Arabasta Kingdom and is capable of destroying entire islands in a single shot. Crocodile first mentioned Pluton when he questioned Nefertari Cobra about its location. Nefertari. Nefertari. <laughs> Nefertari Cobra. I think I said that right. It's supposed to be some kind of large warship. Apparently, when Frankie and Iceberg saw the blueprints, they were both astounded, wondering how a ship like Pluton could be built in the first place. There isn't much else known about it, though. Its power is as dangerous as Poseidon's, who had the ability to sink all the world's islands into the sea. Though exact details of its capabilities are unknown, whoever controlled the weapon had the potential to conquer the world. And it would be dangerous in the wrong hands. Hint, hint, you know, those, uh, those five. Pluton too had the potential to cause as much harm to the world. Furthermore, because the blueprints to the ship remained in existence even after the ship was built, whoever possessed the blueprints to the vessel could build a fleet of vessels with the same destructive abilities as each other. The blueprints had been saved as a means of resurrecting Pluton should the world ever require it, including the original Pluton itself. The Pluton was designed and built on Water 7 during the Void Century, but was rendered inactive after the war. In response to the threat Pluton posed, the world government banned Poneglyph research citing the existence of Pluton, Poseidon, and Uranus as the primary reason. 
Wait, that, that's a that's a shitty excuse now that I think about it. Poseidon is actually a, a living creature, right? Uh, so that that makes no sense. What happened to it after the war has not yet been revealed, but it is supposedly hidden somewhere in Arabasta, and the poneglyph indicating its location is hidden in the kingdom's royal tomb. However, Robin has recently revealed that this is not the case, and its true location is in Wano. Now, our favorite archaeologist has once again proven that she is the most intelligent character in the series. This revelation has a few consequences for the world government. Her affiliation with the revolutionary army makes her the most unique character after Luffy in the Straw Hat Pirate Crew. Nico Robin is also known as the revolutionary army's light of the revolution. Now, before you come after my throat for your elevating her above Sanji and Zoro in importance, please guys, just hear me out. Now, it is well known that Nico Robin spent the two years she was separated from her crew with Dragon and the Revolutionary Army. They share a common vision which is to reveal the secrets that the world government has been keeping from the people. We don't know how long their communication has been sustained after the time skip, but it is safe to assume she has kept a certain amount of communication with them. In light of this revelation, it is understandable why the world government's top priority remains the capture of Robin. Her affiliation with and knowledge of the Poneglyphs make her a dangerous individual, and I see two paths Oda can take with this. The first being that after the revolutionary dragon's long silence, an image is shown of him communicating with Robin and her revealing the location of Pluton to him, thus starting the final stages of the series. And it would be appropriate for them to actually use Pluton to go after, well, the world government and save their chief of staff. Because Remember, we still do not know what happened to Sabo. The second scenario involves her communicating this knowledge with her crew and destroying the weapon at Frankie's insistence, which would present the Straw Hats with their next adventure, which is to find Shanks and the next Poneglyph, leading to the final island where the final arc will commence. Because as we all know, Luffy has no interest in following destinies and this would shoot the story to its final clash. And not to mention in all her research, Robin has never been interested in the weapons, rather she's always been interested in the knowledge that the Poneglyphs reveal. One possibility might be that Pluton is damaged beyond repair and contains the Poneglyph to the next clue. Now while I was actually going through this entire chapter, an idea came to me that was quite... Uh, that was quite peculiar, and I, and I began to think about all the possibilities. Now, more pressing questions arise, such as uh, what is Pluton doing in Wano rather than Arabasta? As the Poneglyph stated, does it have anything to do with the Poneglyph discovered by Zoro and Luffy? Was it entrusted to Wano by Joy Boy, and was it among the ships in his fleet? And my favorite is the pending possible arrival of Blackbeard to claim the ship. See, I told you, the five key characters were important, but we're not done yet. But, as I previously stated, Oda has been writing in the style of Togashi, adding elements as he sees fit. I mean, forget the fact that they had Pluton in their possession and never used it to defeat Kaido and overthrow Orochi. And what happened to the big man pirates on the island? Now, I understand why he needs to throw us off, but my man just messed up and created some major plot holes. I wish that was the end of it because the next matter is quite irritating and honestly, this is where I have a problem with Oda's writing. Now, Admiral Green Boo defeated King and Queen. As I previously stated, this event is crucial in understanding how eager Oda is to end this entire series. Interestingly, I believe this arc was far too short. Oda should have taken his time and taken all the steps he appears to have wanted to take, because it appeared from what I saw that he was working on a tight schedule. Some fights weren't as satisfying as they should have been, and some reviews weren't explored as much as they should have been. If anything, this reminds me of the Usopp uses observation hockey situation, but after that, complete and utter silence. Now, the major problem that I had with this chapter was just this part. Because, let's think about it. These are some of the strongest commanders of the current age. They have merit to their own names. They did not gain fame from simply being part of Kaido's crew. Now, I might sound like a simp, but I don't see King falling at the hands of someone like Green Bull. Because this guy seems like an ass kisser, and yes, he might possess a powerful devil fruit, but with the way Oda presented him, it seems like he's not a character we are going to be actually taken seriously. Let's think about it for a second, now let's just really contemplate about this. One of the greatest battles of all time, and I mean all of them, Kaido vs Luffy, Sanji vs Queen, Zoro vs King, and Big Mom vs Kid and Lo. These battles just happened a while ago, and the characters involved 
just unlocked their latent potentials that put them on par with some of the strongest pirates in history. Then Oda presents this random guy who just hovers along and he beats two of the most powerful commanders in One Piece in their injured state. So the thing is, if, if Oda does something like, like this, that is quite random. And if he says this scenario can actually be equated to the time that uh, Luffy had beaten uh, Gekko Moria on Thriller Bark, and he says it's the same situation as when Kuma arrived, presenting another world of possibilities in terms of strength, then this wouldn't actually make sense. It would actually mean that Green Bull is way more powerful than, than Kaido and Big Mom, which is, which is very preposterous. Then it, it would raise a lot of questions as to why didn't Oda present this character before and have him take them down and you know bring them down. After all, Big Mom and Kaido were also threats to the world government. So if King and Queen were not injured, I would have accepted this scenario, but this situation appears to be Oda trolling Green Boo for a huge disappointment. So here's my prediction. Green Boo arrives and is quickly met by an overwhelming amount of power that forces him to change his attitude and appear more agreeable, and then just fix everything with his devil fruit power. Because chapter after chapter, Oda made it clear that King and Queen are very powerful powerful so for him to do something like this it feels appropriate for a cliffhanger but it seems like he's just in a hurry because if he truly wanted to give us a taste of green Bull's power he would have pitted him up against a revived king and queen now the community is going crazy over this but honestly it's not really exciting because it robs us of the great fight we deserved in terms of how powerful admirals are, we don't exactly know how to scale them because Oda has been inconsistent in this case. During the Marine for Dark, we saw them go up against the Whitebeard commanders and Whitebeard himself. Their battles were at most confusing because Akainu and Kuzan were shown to have been powerful enough to change the geography of an entire island. But yet, Akainu couldn't fully hold his ground against an injured, sick, and tired old man. <laughs> It's according to my understanding that admirals are as powerful as Yonkos, but how many battles have ever been recorded between Yonkos and admirals in order for us to actually believe this? No, seriously, that, that's an actual question. I'm, I'm not trolling you guys. In the way he presented this character, it gets you to actually think and question Oda's words. How powerful are the Red Hair Pirates? Is Green Bull actually powerful at all? But yeah, it feels more and more like Togashi was writing this specific part, and it worked because now I want to see more. Now, his power holds the ability to revive the entire land of Wano, so this isn't a coincidence. After all, I remember how Oda presented another slimy character who looked very intimidating only for him to be used as comedic relief. With that said, the last item on our list is the new Yonko list, which made me laugh because our great Captain Buggy D clown somehow made his way to the top and is now... <laughs> and is now... Oh boy. And he is now on the same level as his former crewmate Red Hair Shanks. And I'm not sure if this is just another way Oda decided to make us laugh or if there's more to the clown than meets the eye. Of course, we can't have a situation like this without people coming up with wild theories about what, is, about what it means. And one of my personal favorites is this one, written by Soba Kick. I believe that Shanks went to the five orders to warn them about Buggy. Buggy acts further, but in reality, after Roger's death, he wanted to become strong. Buggy has always looked for Captain John's treasure. Captain John was a former Rock's crew pirate. Buggy has found that treasure. It is the ancient weapon Uranus. On top of that, Buggy may act weak, but he knows how to utilize his devil fruit power. The twist is, he has all three types of haki. If we don't get something along the lines of this, then Oda is trolling. First off, I don't think I've ever said Buggy so many times. Can you tell me how many times I said Buggy? I love a good and crazy theory because sometimes it turns out to be true. But let's review this because firstly, I wouldn't point it out if it didn't interest me. The first point I love about this theory is how it points out Buggy being part of the Pirate King's crew, but yet being so weak. He went from fighting for two days straight to this unbelievably weak man. So what's up with that? Buggy, to me, represents what happens when fear wins. From the first time his backstory was revealed in the first few episodes of the show, 
His character was that of a self-serving man with little to no loyalty for anyone but himself. He was cautious to some extent and he would always turn and run rather than face his problems. Shanks went on to form one of the strongest crews in the world while Baggy retreated to the corners of the world and while he was known, he was nothing special. Only upon meeting Luffy, did he get thrust back into the limelight? Everything up to this point has happened by chance for him. We've seen him alone with his thoughts and not once has he been shown to have some malicious motives. I'm not saying it's completely impossible. There might be a possibility that Oda has been holding some information from us. After all, look at Kanjuro. We thought he had nothing to hide but we were wrong. And I'm the man who believes Robin has had some contact with the Revolutionary Army, so who am I to judge? But I personally believe that the world government just wants someone to take the focus away from Luffy. Captain John's treasure is Uranus. That's, uh, that's quite a bold statement. Anyways, Uranus was a weapon that was known to exist during the Void Century. Its actions at this time in history, specifications, abilities, location, and what happened to it since are all unknown. And uh, just, just a side note, I'm actually thinking of making a video about this one because I have an idea of uh, what Uranus is or who it might be. So of course, to take this mystery on Buggy is uh, quite lazy. I'm sorry my guy or my girl. I would rather believe that he was faking being weak but I'll do more research into this one like I said. It would be interesting to learn that after Buggy discovered the truth about Luffy's battle with Kaido, he decided to make his move and meet up with Shanks to carry out their long awaited plan since their captain's death and finally avenge his death and fulfill the dream of Joy Boy. If you've made it this far, please check out the rest of my content on my channel and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for future mossy content.